Good afternoon, everybody. Our topic today is going to be red wine fermentation and red wine production. And I think most of you are aware that uh, red wine is uh, the most popular class of wines. They're known for their really intense flavors and their really intense aromas. These good things, these flavors and aromas that we all appreciate, are actually extracted from the skins. So the color of the red wine comes from contact with the skins. And the balance and the tannins and the things we appreciate that add structure and backbone to the wine really stem from contact with the skins. In fact, some of these tannins even protect the red wines during aging. Uh, the color of the wine is also uh, affected by temperature. As you know, uh, wines, grapes that grow in cooler temperatures have a lower pH and tend to have a redder color, and grapes that are grown in warmer climates tend to have a higher pH and more purplish color. So overall, though, red wine grapes tend to grow better in warmer areas than whites. In fact, uh, there's a classification system that we can go over here um, <clears throat> that is based on the number of degree days in a particular area. So it's a way to classify regions and again help us make sure we can match up the right varietal to the correct temperature. So here are the, uh, the various climate zones that we'll see. It's based on the growing season. The growing season for grapes is typically April 1st through October 1st. It's about 180 days long. We know that grapes only grow at temperatures over 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So this system tracks the amount that the day's average temperature exceeds 50 degrees. And then it, it adds all of those up for the course of the growing season, and that tells us how many degree days there were. So, for instance, for a cool region like we have in Sonoma, maybe down in the Carneros uh, area, there'll be less than 2,500 degree days. Whereas in a slightly warmer region, such as the Russian River, you can see there where it's uh, protected a bit by the fog coming up, uh, they'll have 2,500 to 3,000 degree days. As we go inland a bit further, away from the ocean, uh, we have even warmer temperatures. The city of Ukiah to the north of Sonoma County here uh, will have from 3,000 to 3,500 degree days. A little further inland, uh, say in Lake County, uh, we'll be in Region 4. And then the hottest area, as you can see here, is the, uh, the Central Valley where they'll have over 4,000 degree days. So we need to match our grape varietal to the number of degree days in the region. And uh, that'll give us the best flavors. For instance, uh, Pinot Noir likes it cool. It will grow in an area like Russian River Valley or the Carneros area of Sonoma. We need to review some of our growing practices also as we're getting ready for uh, the harvest. Uh, going over uh, with our growers, we need to look at some of the cultural practices they use. Uh, we want to make sure they let the sunlight in. As you remember, shaded berries are going to ripen more slowly, so we won't get those nice high sugar levels. They're going to have less color because we need light to reach them in order to get those colors. Shaded berries are also going to be susceptible to various types of fungus and mold, such as botrytis. We'll talk about botrytis later when we go into sweet wines. But we have to be careful because too much sun can also sunburn the skins of the grapes. So we need to be a little bit careful there. We also want the vine to struggle. Uh, the more water, the more irrigation we allow the vine to have, the more we're going to tend to get grassy, vegetative flavors. That's not what the customer wants. Whereas with less water, making the vine struggle a bit more, we may have a lower yield, 
but we'll tend to get more of those elements that we're really striving for, more fruity flavors and, and more backbone to our wines. Uh, we don't want the, wine, the grapes to be too vigorous. If, if our vines are too vigorous, then we're going to uh, wind up with all of the energy going into growing leaves instead of getting those nice berries to grow. So the production of red wines actually begins uh, in late summer, uh, maybe about a month before the harvest. We're, the winemakers are going to go out and start sampling the grapes so that they can come up with a picking plan. So they'll have an idea of how the different lots are going to ripen, and then they can plan the picking and, and try to help try to get some of the labor scheduled in. At harvest time, the sugar components are rising and the acidity in the grapes is dropping. Uh, red, red grapes tend to ripen longer than white wine grapes, and that allows us to get that higher sugar level and lower acid that, that we want instead of what appears in white grapes. Uh, typical readings for the grapes during harvest would be 23.1 BRIX levels, uh, pH of 3.4, and total acidity of 0.7. We're going to come up with this data by sampling our grapes. We'll, we'll pick about 100 berries from all over the vineyard and different parts of the cluster and uh, use them in order to, to get our readings. As you know, a higher BRICS level will lead to more sugar, which means a higher alcohol level in our wine. And the higher alcohol actually aids in the extraction of the things we need in order to get more color, more flavor, and more backbone to our wines. So we're going, to, uh, we're going to hustle the grapes in from the vineyard and we'll crush them quickly and usually add some SO2 at this point in time. What that's going to do is kill the wild yeast that, that might be on the skins. We want to be able to control the fermentation so the winemaker typically prefers to uh, use a yeast of his choosing that will do the things he wants it to do rather than the gamble of whatever wild yeast is on the skins. We want to immediately convert the, the grapes to a must. That releases the juice so we can start working with it. It also gives us a, a consistency that we can pump around the winery in our pipes. Uh, the tannins that uh, are released with the juice also can help act as an antioxidant to uh, prevent oxidation of the wine. So the reds are going to go directly to a, to a tank. We don't press the red grapes at this point like we do the white wine grapes. Often what we'll do is run them to a large tank where we'll cold soak them at a low temperature. We'll cold soak them for 12 hours to, to 48 hours. That's going to help us get more color extracted from the skins and more of those fruity flavors that we like. Uh, typically, at this point, we want to get things just the way we want them before we add yeast. So like I said, we're going to kill off the wild yeast. Uh, if more acid is needed, uh, we, can, we can add some tartaric acid. Uh, we can adjust the nitrogen so that the yeast will have plenty of food to, to eat and stay alive while they're conducting the fermentation. Once we have everything right, then we'll add the yeast. So after cold soaking, we're going to add the, add the yeast and begin our fermentation. Now with red grapes, the skins are in with the juice as fermentation is taking place. So we get a lot of skin contact during fermentation. The name for that skin contact is maceration. So we want, to, we want to make sure the skins stay in the tank so that we can extract more color, more flavor, and more tannins. In fact, at this point, almost a quarter of what's in the tank uh, consists of skins. And as fermentation continues, carbon dioxide is given off, and as that bubbles up to the top of the tank, the skins actually rise up to the top also and float there. So ultimately what happens is a cap forms at the top of the tank. Now if that cap is allowed to dry out, then vinegar bacteria can grow and cause our wine to spoil. So for a variety of reasons, we want to keep that cap wet. Um, 
So we're going to allow the grapes to ferment for, let's say, 7 days to 30 days. It's a faster fermentation than for white wines, and it takes place at a higher temperature also. So part of what we want to do then is manage the cap. Uh, the purpose of managing the cap is to keep that cap moist so that we can ensure that color and flavor extraction take place. We don't want it just floating up there. We've got to get the skins down in with the juice so that we can extract those elements. Um, that will also help us prevent the uneven distribution of heat. So we, we really don't want one part of the tank to be really hot and fermenting furiously while another part is cooler. And it also prevents gas pockets from forming where spoilage can occur. So there's several different ways of managing the cap. Uh, the most common would be called the pump over. That's where we take the juice from the bottom of the tank and run it up and spray the top of the cap with it. You can see there's a lady here doing it the hard way, okay, actually holding a hose up at the top of the tank. Um, it's a little bit easier if you've got your plumbing set up. In the second picture, you can, you can see that uh, it's being sprayed right out of a pipe that comes from the lower portion of the tank. Pumping over uh, typically happens about three times a day. It's nice in that it's very gentle, and it can be pretty precise as far as what you're trying to accomplish. Another method of managing the cap is called the punch down. And that's where we've got our uh, juice in an open tank, and the cap floats up to the top. And we've actually got people up at the top pushing the skins back down into the juice. One winery I visited uh, called Fritz Winery, you know, they said they would actually have the local football team come over and help them with the punch down because it is physically demanding. There are also mechanical assists that will help us take care of the punch down that way. Another option is the horizontal fermenter. That is a, it's an expensive way to go, and it actually works kind of like a cement mixer, rotating in order to, to keep the skins moistened. So at some point during our fermentation, maybe midway through primary fermentation, we're going to press the must. We're going to get the juice off of the skins. Just to give you an overview, there's usually four times to press. Uh, one, we can press sweet, where there's still two to five bricks level in the must. That's going to work really well for us uh, and ultimately give us a kind of a fruity, early maturing wine. We can do what we call pressing hot. As soon as fermentation is finished, um, while the temperature of the must is still pretty warm, we're going to go ahead and press. Or we can let it cool off for a few days, let that temperature lower and uh, press it cold. The last option that I'll talk about in a few minutes uh, is called extended maceration. That's where we really spend a lot of time with the skin still in there in order to get some more complex tannins out. So how long do we want that skin contact to continue? How long do we, do we wait until we press? Uh, it's a real advantage for reds to have a longer skin contact because then we can get more of those desirable elements, more color, more flavor. Um, for Cabernet Sauvignon or Zinfandel, uh, maybe six or seven days of skin contact uh, can work out well. If we want the contact to take place longer, we can perform what we call extended maceration. That's where even after fermentation is finished, we're going to keep the skins in with the juice. So the skin contact keeps going even after all of the sugar has been used up. In fact, we can keep that skin contact going uh, for weeks if we want. The bad news is that takes up a lot more tanks and that can get expensive for you. So there is a cost to extended maceration. Another option is to use a sealed tank and we can do what's called sinking the cap making sure it's totally uh, submerged in the liquid. And uh, that, again, can help uh, extract tannins and, uh, and polymerization in order to soften the wine. After the desired amount of skin contact, then, uh, we can uh, drain out all of the juice. So what will happen is we'll take the juice that's above the skins and we'll 
pump it off, and then we'll shovel out the remaining skins. Now, that can be kind of a dangerous job, oddly enough. Um, carbon dioxide is given off by fermentation, so there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the tanks, and it tends to sink down to the bottom. So as your man crawls through the manhole in order to get in and shovel out the skins, uh, oftentimes they're not getting enough oxygen and they can even pass out. So typically it's a two-man job, and if the man inside the tank is having a problem, the second man can pull him out of the tank safely. So we're going to shovel out the skins, and we'll send them over to the press. By doing that, we get about 5% more juice than we would have had by just pressing the wet skins. Uh, we can save that, by, that, that uh, fraction separate from the free-run juice that we'd had and possibly use it to blend back in later on. So the pressing for the red wines goes, goes faster than the pressing did for our whites. It's easier to press because the skins are softer and it gets taken care of more quickly. Uh, the good news, again, is we get about 5% more juice by being able to press the red wine skins. And we don't have to add rice hulls or anything to the press in order to make sure that the juice can get out. So little advantage there that the yield for reds is higher than the yield for white wines. Those skins give up some additional juice. And you can see what's left over is the pomace. You can see the press cake there still in the, the circular shape. <clears throat> so at this point, our primary fermentation is over. Next, we're going to do what we did with some of our white wines. We're going to encourage malolactic fermentation. Uh, it really about 90% of red whites and red wines and really, any premium red wine is going to undergo malolactic fermentation. Uh, that helps it develop the complexity that customers are looking for. So again, what we do, we introduce these malolactic bacteria, and they're going to change the malic acid into lactic acid, and that's going to help kind of smooth the wine out. After the malolactic fermentation is finished, we're going to have to go through a series of steps in order to clarify and stabilize the wine. So at this point then, uh, reds are clarified actually before bulk aging, during bulk aging, and after aging it in bulk. Um, and what we'll do is we'll have a series of rackings that we'll do, and we can also use a couple of techniques, one called fining, the other called filtering. So typically we rack it one to three times the first year and then maybe at six month intervals after that. What we're doing is separating the wine from the lees, whatever yeast and, and other particles were left over from the fermentation. You can see here a couple of examples. Here's a fellow racking the wine from barrel to barrel or if it's taking place in stainless steel tanks. Um, running it from tank to tank in order to, to clarify the wine. A lot of the time, we'll have to use fining. We talked about this when we spoke of white wines, uh, but the wine may still be hazy or dull due to proteins and other residues floating around in it. And this fining agent will react or absorb the targeted substances. They join together and it's a heavier molecule and will drift down to the bottom so that we can rack it off, rack off the good juice that's on top. Uh, fining can use a variety of different elements. Uh, we can use gelatin, we can use egg whites in order to clarify the red wine. But it will improve the clarity of the wine, it will uh, reduce the bitterness. It is something to be careful of though because if we do too much fining or too much filtering, we can strip some of the good flavors out of the wine. So we don't want to overdo it. Another advantage of, uh, of working with the wine at this point is uh, we've got to make sure that we don't allow any microbes in that can cause spoilage. So as the wine is in the tanks or in the barrels, we want to make sure that it's always filling those containers up so that there isn't room for air to get in and interact with the wine.
So at this point then, we're, we're aging the wine, and typically we'll age it in bulk first. For instance, a Cabernet Sauvignon will age in bulk uh, in large tanks for about six months. The large tanks, they can be made out of oak or redwood or even stainless steel. But during that time, uh, the, the wines will lose some of that yeastiness, and also uh, it'll reduce some of the fruity fermentation characters that, that we really want to discourage. Then after being aged in bulk, we can move the, the wine off into oak barrels. The oak barrels, one of you groups will be working on the advantages and disadvantages of aging in oak and how to go about it. But it, essentially it helps the, the grapes express their varietal character. It decreases the bitterness and the astringency of the wine. It becomes smoother and it also becomes uh, more concentrated, primarily due to evaporation. Uh, filtration is another way to clarify and, and stabilize our wines. Um, and what we're really doing is just straining out any suspended solids. Um, that's going to help to increase the clarity and the stability of the wine. You can see here there's a, uh, a depth filter, also known as a plate and frame, that we can use. Uh, in the middle is a membrane filter. And then there's even a, a mobile filtering operation that can pull up to your door. If you don't own your own equipment, they can come in and take care of your filtering for you. So all of these are, are ways to strain out things that we don't want in the wine. There are a lot of uh, opportunities to filter the wine. This will just show a few places where we could uh, be working with our wine in, in order to make it a better product. The, uh, the last step is to, to finish the wine and bottle it. A lot of the time, this is where some blending takes place. For instance, uh, if we're trying to make a Bordeaux, or the American version of a Bordeaux would be called a Meritage, uh, that's when we can bring in our different varietals. We can bring in our Cabernet Sauvignon, our Cab Franc, our Merlot, uh, maybe Malbec and Petit Verdot, and uh, do our final blending right before we bottle it. Um, in Italy, with your uh, Chianti, it only has to be 90% Sangiovese, so there's 10% other kinds of grapes that we can blend in with it. Or we can just blend in grapes from different lots in our vineyard. But the last step before we, uh, before we bottle the, the wine is to sterile filter it. We want to make sure there's no microbes in there, nothing that can cause spoilage, it causes problems once that wine has gone into the bottle. And a lot of the time, what you'll see is wine going into green and brown bottles because that will protect it from the light. So as it's on display at a retail store, we, we won't have spoilers that might occur if it was in a clear bottle. Uh, after bottling, um, the reds especially can benefit from aging in the bottle. That allows long polymers to join together and form up, and again, they'll sink to the bottom, and, and we'll just have good wine in the upper portion of the bottle. Uh, some reactions take place. Uh, we don't want much oxygen in, but sometimes uh, just a little bit of oxygen will also help to soften that wine, whatever can work its way in through the cork. Uh, with reds, a lot of time we'll hold them up to four years or so before releasing them. So that's kind of the end of the trail for our uh, routine red wines. There is another style, another way of accomplishing fermentation that I want to mention, and that's called carbonic maceration. That's where essentially the, the fermentation is taking place inside the berry. We're fermenting whole berries. Um, <clears throat> there's, uh, there's no yeast added. We're just putting whole clusters into the tank, and enzymes actually take care of fermentation within the grape, uh, developing the alcohol for us. Uh, typically, there's some free-run juice, and that's actually the inferior juice because it took place just with uh, normal fermentation uh, from the juice that sank to the bottom. But the whole berries that remain, that wine comes out in your press run 
as you crush those berries. And it's actually the more desirable wine because it's uh, it fermented inside the grape. Uh, this kind of uh, fermentation gives us a youthful, fruity characteristics. Uh, Beaujolais would be the classic type of wine made with carbonic maceration. Uh, it's meant to be consumed within three to six months or so. And uh, the saying would be that it's swallowed rather than sipped. So it's nice tasting wine that, that goes down very easily. It's typically low in alcohol, kind of low in acid, has a it does not have a lot of color to it. Uh, it really doesn't have a lot of body or, and a lot of sugar. So it's just a good, nice, fresh kind of wine to consume quickly. And that takes us through the fermentation of red wines. Uh, we've worked our way through all of these steps from receiving the grapes through crushing them, uh, cold soaking the grapes, the fermentation, and then the whole racking and, and fining and filtering process as uh, we're clarifying and stabilizing the grapes. So thank you very much, and we'll see you next week.
measures and then five from the books. Each paragraph should have at least separate topic sentence and generally be no longer than one.
accused of DOQ, desired amount. Wait, how come this one's this one's not different from this one, is it? It's just the second one. No, this one's this one's not different from this one. And it's the same. Yeah, they are the same. These are just two different problems. Mm -hmm. Same thing. And what do they call this? The compound? No, this is that one on time. What's this one? The setup. The setup cost. The setup cost. The setup cost. The setup cost. Thank you. 